Hey everyone, welcome to Church on Main's online campus. We're thankful for you joining us and we look forward to a powerful time of worship, prayer, and being challenged by the Word of God. So before we get started, I have a couple of tips to help you get the most out of this service. The first one is be present. Attending church online can come with a multitude of distractions, whether it be the multitasking that you're doing at home or even the digital notifications on your phone. We want you to engage and be intentional about the next hour that you have with us. Second, like, comment, and share. Right now with the digital climate we're in, it's never been easier to interact with one another. So use those reaction buttons, share the service, and invite other people that you may know. You can do all of this by creating an account at live.churchonmain.net where you can chat, request prayer, keep track of your notes online, and most importantly, use our built-in Bible app. Let's stand to our feet, if you would, Genesis chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 and 2 today. I'm going to talk about carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. Being a father has never been easy, but it's never been more difficult, probably, uh, in our lifetime than today. And so I'm going to talk about carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders, but I want you to understand this is not just for fathers. I think we're all going to relate to this today, but obviously we're kind of focusing today the thought on a father and being a husband, a, a man, a godly man, a provider, a Christian. Uh, I read a statistic the other day. If you're a young couple, you're not going to like this. If you're a young father, you're certainly not going to like this. Did you know it's over $200,000 to raise a child now up to college? That'll scare you to death. So, you know, when you think about responsibilities and all that goes on with it, uh, there's a lot there. And we're, we're living in a, in a, at a time that could become very overwhelming. Every, it takes everybody working, everybody doing, and all of those things, and I understand it. So, when you, you search into that, we're going to look at a man today by the name of Abraham, a father in the Old Testament, a patriarch and into the life of Abraham and kind of how God used him in the midst of a crisis in his life. So let's read Genesis 12, verses 1 and 2. The Bible said, The Lord said to to Abram, Go from (coughs) from your country and your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Father, take your word today, and I pray it wouldn't return void. You'd speak deeply into all of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There's a lot of characters in the Old Testament, a lot of patriarchs that we could look at, Adam, Uh, Cain, Abraham, obviously we're looking at here today, Moses, David. I mean, there's just tons of them through there. But we're going to search into the life of Abraham. Doesn't matter where you look at any of these lives, you're going to find out they were messed up and God used them. They were not perfect men by any means, but God used them. I don't know if you know this. You might even want to look at somebody you're sitting sitting beside and tell them, just tell them this. Hey, I'm messed up. Go ahead, just tell them. I'm I'm messed up, right? Now, I want you to look back and say, you sure are, amen? I mean, you are messed up, right? We're all messed up. We've all come through things, and, and God still uses messed up people. Thank God for that, right? God uses people that honor him. Abraham is from the Ur of Chaldees. Ur is a, a city we would know today uh, on the, is in the corner of Iraq, and so He is in this little place that was a godless place, a place that uh, did not really know God even then. They served many gods. They were what we would call polytheists, worshipers of many gods. Abraham begins to understand through a relationship with the God, the only God, he begins to believe and understand that there is only one true God. Abraham becomes a monotheist, in other words, a worshiper of the one true God not of many gods. His faith begins to grow. And here in the passage that we just read, the Bible says the very first thing God tells him to do in verse 1 is go. And then after he says go, God says in the end of verse 1, if you go, I will show you. In verse 2, I will make you. Again, I will bless you. Verse 3, I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. 
So God says, Abraham, if you're obedient to go, I'll be obedient to do what I promised that I would do. Abraham has a lot of issues in his life, just like I said, all of us do. When Abraham had to begin to follow the Lord, there wasn't a precedent. He didn't have somebody to say, well, it worked for them, it's working for me. No, God spoke to Abraham. Abraham believed God, began to obey God, and then God began to show himself faithful to Abraham. You know, when you go to chapter 12, you start seeing God call this man really like a missionary. I want you to leave your country, leave your people, go. And when you go do this, watch what I'm going to do. Abraham probably was thinking, okay, I go, but what do I do? A lot of questions. How many of you have a toddler at your house? Do they not ask a lot of questions? Why? Because. Why? Because. Why not? Because. When? Because. I mean, it's just never stops. I can imagine if I was Abraham and God says, leave everything you know, go to a place. I'm not even going to tell you where to go yet. I just want you to get up and start going. You're not going to have a GPS. You're not going to have uh, uh, an answer. You're not going to have an outcome. All you're going to have is a promise. If you will go, I will. The great I am will. Now, that's a big deal. So I want to ask you some questions, five basic questions today that I want you to consider and to ask yourself based on this passage. We're going to jump into chapter 22. So I want you to go forward 10 chapters to chapter 22 of Genesis. The first question I want to ask you this morning is when God's word is clear, will you obey him? When God's word is clear, will you obey him? The Bible says in 22 verse 1, after these things, in other words, after he left, after he started the journey, the Bible says God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. When you think about God speaking, he really spoke, obviously, in a way that Abraham knew that God was talking to him. Now, when, when I grew up, it's one thing, if, if mom calls your name, that's a big deal. She's wanting something. But if she calls your first name and your middle name, you better get busy, because I mean, business is picking up, right? Mom is serious about it. She, you know she means business. And when God said, Abraham, I believe God knew that he was serious, and Abraham knew God was serious. And the Bible says he tested Abraham. We're not going to go there, but in chapter 15, verse 6, the Bible says, talking of Abraham, he believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, Abraham had a lot of issues. He had a lot of problems. You can read the story of him and his nephew Lot and the, the confrontation that had taken place there. He lived through a famine in the land of Egypt. Abraham uh, jumped ahead of God's plan for his life and, and even sinned. He, uh, you can read about it with Hagar, the handmaid. You can read in his story how he lied about his wife, Sarah. So Abraham's not a perfect man. Abraham's not a, oh, look at all the righteousness of him. Certainly God would use him. No, he was simply a man that God chose to use, and he chose to follow God and obey what God said. When God's word is very clear, what do you do? Do you obey him? Look at verse 2, still staying on the subject. God says to him, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the Moriah, look at what he says, and offer him there a burnt offering in, on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. I mean, I want you to take your one and only son. Now, context here. Go backwards some years, and Abraham is 100 years old. Sarah is 99, and they have no children. Wouldn't that be nice? No, it wouldn't be. You, you want children. I'm sorry. You want children. There. So, 100 years old, and God says, Sarah, you're going to have a baby. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can just imagine a hundred-year-old Abraham walking in, and he says, Sarah, what's that? She says, oh, that's called a bassinet. It's a bassinet. What is a bassinet? What is that in there? Oh, that's baby clothes. And there's diapers, and there's bottles. He's like, well, what is that for? And she says, Abraham, guess what? I'm going to have a baby. Now, I don't know about you. I'm 58. But if I walked into my house... And my wife says, I need to talk to you about something. Now, you might be fine with that, 
but she would probably be a widow because I'd die of a heart attack right there, right? I mean, it's like, what in the world? I mean, a uh, hundred years old. And, and she has the baby. I mean, she has the baby. That's a miracle, right? But God had promised she would have the baby because Isaac was going to be the lineage in which we know Israel would come. And eventually, Jesus, the Messiah, comes through that lineage. God had promised Isaac for a reason. So Abraham says, okay, God, you gave him to us for a purpose. We gave him back to you to use whatever. And now you want me to kill him? I mean, there have been some times, if you're a parent, you've probably made this statement. I brought you in this world and what? I can take you out. We probably all thought that occasionally. I get it. But this is real. Abraham, I want you to go offer your son my promise to you from God. I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. God was testing Abraham's faith. He, he, he was really, in essence, he says, I want you to take your son and go. You go do what I've told you to do. In verse 3, Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey, took the two of the young men with him, and his son Isaac cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose, and look at the last phrase, went to the place of which God had told him. You'll see in a few minutes in the story, if he had went anywhere else, the story would have turned bad. But he went where God told him. Now, oftentimes, we, especially in these days, have y'all heard this phrase recently? We're living in unprecedented times. Have you heard that? But can I, can I encourage you? Every generation since Adam and Eve have lived in unprecedented times. And you know what we found? God has always been faithful. God will honor his word when we honor God's word. And so Abraham is not sure what to do, and you might be there today. I'm facing a big trial in my life. I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. I don't know where to go next. What do I do? Here's the answer to that question. First, do what God has made very clear to do. Go to his word and find out if he is clear in his word, start there, and then you can wrestle through the other parts where you're unclear. Here's the thing I know. I need to learn the Bible more, right? Do you? I need to study it more. We all need to, but I know this. I know to do more of this book than I'm currently doing. If I just started with what I knew and I did it every day, it might be amazing what God would reveal going forward. Second question, when God is leading, will you follow him? When God is leading you, will you follow him? Verse 4, on the third day, he lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from afar. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over and worship and come again to you. So you can imagine Abraham is coming up the mountain. He has Isaac. He has the wood. He has the fire. He has two young men that have been helping him. And he says, I want you all to stay here. Now, there's a lot of reasons and you can debate. But I wonder if he didn't say Guys, I want you to stay here because he knew later they would have tried to stop him from doing what God was calling him to do. He had to walk. You know, there, this is a sad thing, but sometimes people that came with you here may not go with you there. <laughs> sometimes you have to realize that there's people that are not going to help you on the journey. You have, to, you have to make those calls, and it's hard sometimes. Abraham and Isaac continue the journey. When God is leading, will you follow him? Isaac was the future, and God had made it very plain to, to Abraham. I've given you this son for a reason, for a purpose, because I'm going to bring the lineage of Messiah. Abraham knew that, but he also knew that God was telling him to do something that was going completely against his thinking. So here goes Abraham and Isaac. He couldn't add it all up. And I'll just tell you, there are times when God will begin to show you and help you and, and want you to do things, and it will go so countercultural that it won't make sense to you. God, you, you want me to stand up? The world and everybody's saying that this is okay, but your word is very clear. And if I do this, it does not make sense to everybody else. The problem or the question here is, but will you still do it? If the Bible is clear and he's showing you what to do, will you continue to do what is right? no matter what the culture says. Abraham begins to walk up the mountain. 
You know, oftentimes we'll say things like to a missionary, maybe we'll be careful going there because that's not safe. Or what would happen? You may get there and it's, it's, it's not safe. But God's not promising us that things will be safe. What he's promising us is he will be with us wherever we go if he, if he leads us there. Karen Watson, back in 2004, was a Baptist missionary in Iraq. And Karen Watson was killed. She was murdered as a missionary. And she had a, a letter she had written to her pastor, and it said, opening case of death. And it says, dear pastor, you should only be opening this in the event of my death. When God calls, there are no regrets. I tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I wasn't called to a place. I was called to him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory, my reward. The missionary heart cares more than some think is wise, risks more than some think is safe, dreams more than some think is practical, expects more than some think is possible. I was called not to comfort or to success, but to obedience. And then she finishes some other things. When you think about when God is leading you and asking you and, and compelling you or calling you to do something for him, are you still willing to obey it? It's a huge question. So if his word is clear, will you follow it? Will you then obey in, uh, his leading when he leads you? The third question is this. When you don't understand, will you trust him? Okay, so I want to ask you a personal question. This is probably, it may be a, a, a women, it may be to you, but I think it probably leans a little bit more toward guys. How many of you argue with the GPS in your car? How many of you say, if the GPS says you can be there at 946, I'm going to go, you ain't seen me. I can be there at 942. How many of you with me, right? Years ago, when I first got our first GPS, it was a female voice. Turn right. I was like, I get that at home. I'm not getting that in my car, too. I changed it. <laughs> right? One time I had, because his name Lim Nelson, you know, the guy, the movie actor, and it was his voice, and he would say, turn right at the next intersection, you know? Slow down, cops ahead. I'm like, you know, it was really cool. I liked him. He was awesome. It was awesome. But I argued. So we were on the way out here yesterday, and I said, I don't like what the GPS, that's, that, no, I don't want to go that way, and I'm going to go a better way. Almost every time I do that, I find out there was a big reason I should not have done that. When you listen to God and you obey his word, there will be times that you'll say, this makes no sense. I'm adding it up, and it does not add up. No, not to the carnal mind, but to the Word of God and the Spirit of God who knows all things, who has been there, who knows the end from the beginning. You can trust Him, and you can know that He's right. So that third question is, when you don't understand, will you trust Him? So verse 7 in our text, Isaac says to his father Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, son, my son. He said, behold, the fire, the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, I know this wasn't a comical scene there, but to me, I kind of see it comical. Now, looking back, Abraham and Isaac are walking, and I can see Isaac going, okay, dad's got a knife, dad's got the wood, dad's got the fire, but dad ain't got no lamb. I mean, God, where is the sacrifice? I don't, uh, dad? I need to ask you a question. It didn't make sense. It didn't look right. Something didn't add up to Isaac, but Isaac still obeyed, and Abraham kept following through with what he knew God had told him. Now, as this begins to progress, God is going to teach Abraham and Isaac the biggest lesson of their life. The Bible says in verse 8, Abraham says to his son, Isaac, God will provide for himself a lamb. For a burnt offering, my son. So they both went, uh, both of them together. They kept walking. You see, Abraham didn't teach his son that he would provide. He taught his son that God would provide. And I'm telling you, there, there are some stories that as fathers, we need to teach our children. When have they heard us pray? When have they heard us tell of the goodness of God? When have they heard us tell how God provided that? And there would have been no other way had God not done that. 
My dad is having a lot of health issues, but a few years ago on Christmas, all of our family was there, his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and we began to ask him stories, and they began to talk about in, in their early marriage and his early ministry how God had provided, and God had done this, and God had done that, and, and I began to watch our children and, and grandchildren just intently listening, and I knew what they were hearing was God did this for Papa. God can do this for us. And I want to encourage you, never forget what God has done, but don't keep it to yourself. They need to hear it. You need to tell others how God provides. So God begins to speak, and Abraham listens. It's easy to get our priorities out of order. We can even begin to look at things in a different way, and we look at it through our lens. Again, we're trying to add things up our way and do things the way we think they should be done. When you think about trusting God, when's the last time that you literally got to a spot where there's no answer unless God comes through? There'll be people this week that'll go to a doctor and the doctor will give news that unless God comes through, there's no way. There'll be people that'll face a relationship problem with a spouse, and unless God comes through, there is no way. There'll be things that'll happen and may happen. I pray it doesn't happen to you, but I can promise you this. Whenever or however that comes about, if you're following the Word of God, you may not know where and how this will end, but you can have one promise. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You can know for sure that if you're following him, he is going to continue to be there and help you through that process. When you think about, I don't understand, I don't know where I'm going. I mean, Abraham is leaving his family. He's going where he don't know. Now God's telling him to kill his only son. I mean, this is a big deal. Fourth question. When things become critical, will you still be faithful to him? When things become critical, will you still be faithful? So the Bible says, verse 9, they came to a place, notice the next phrase, which God had told him. There again, he went where God said, not where he thought. And then Abraham built an altar there. And he laid the wood in in the order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. I mean, now this thing's getting serious. Now we're to a place where there's not a lot of wiggle room to get out of this one. God's got to do something or we don't know where it's going to go. Excuse me. So the Bible says, verse 10, Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. I mean, boy, now it's getting really critically serious. If there was ever a time to quit, that would have been it. If there's ever a time to question God and go backwards, that was the time. But Abraham is still obeying God even when everything seems to look bad and wrong in the wrong way. You know, I look at also this and I think about it for a moment. God had shown himself faithful to Abraham prior to this. So now Abraham is starting to see a pattern of how God God honors his word, how God takes care of his children. I could take you through stories, and I think had God not done that, I would not be here. Had God not said that and showed that and took care of that, I would not have. And I mean, I'm telling you, if you can do that and you see where God provides and how God honors, it will help you in the future to trust him, to know that he's going to do what he said. So in verse 11, notice what's happening here. He said, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. I mean, I don't think it took him long to answer. Abraham. Now, when your name is called twice here, that's kind of like that first name, last name. I mean, this is getting serious. When I was, a, I was a teenager, I was about 13 or 14. I was a young teenager, and we were in church. My dad was pastor. And I was sitting over right on that side, kind of back there with some other teenagers and I don't know exactly what we was doing, but I don't think we were having a devotion time. I think we were cutting up in church and doing whatever. My dad was preaching. I don't remember exactly what he was saying, but it was something like, you know, and God said this, and God this, and the Bible this, and God said, Rodney, quit talking back there, boy. 
<laughs> you know, well, you talk, it gets your attention, man. I mean, call my name right out in front of God and everybody. And then you know what he did? He said, hey, get up and come over here and sit down with your mama. She was sitting way down over here. Now, you imagine a 13-year-old boy and to get up and walk all in front of the whole church down to your mama. I still don't talk in church today. My dad's six hours away, but he'd probably call me out today. So I don't talk in church. I mean, you know, whatever. I'm kidding. Can you imagine at the lowest point, the most critical time in his life, he don't know what's going to happen, and he hears the voice of God speaking to him. Now, God's not going to call your name audibly. You're not going to hear this, you know, Rodney, Rodney. That's not what he's doing. I'll tell you what he'll do. If you'll be in his word and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he will guide you into all truth. The Bible says that. Abraham, Abraham, here I am, Lord. I mean, just like that. God calls his name and I believe theologically, there are some people that will debate back and forth on this, this topic here. I believe God never intended or would have allowed Abraham to kill his son. But what he was doing is he's putting him to the ultimate test. Not that God would know, but that Abraham would see. And I'm telling you, the more you see God, the more you'll trust him the next time. We'll off, we've been married 37 years. <laughs> I'll still try my own way, and it won't work on something, and she'll go like, well, if you'd have done what I told you, I hate that. Right? So verse 12, hear my Lord. And then verse 12, do not lay your hand on the boy or do him anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. And he's really, if you read that, you'll understand what he's saying. I know, I know you in a way that you know yourself, you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. This is critical. (laughs) And he obeyed. All of a sudden, God speaks, and Abraham is like, oh, yeah, well, I was, you know, (laughs) be like all the rest of us. I'm going to write a book now on how not to sacrifice your son, how God speaks. I mean, no, it it was like, man, had God not shown up, I don't know what I'd have done. Yesterday morning, we have three grandchildren, Colt, Peyton, and Carter. And Colt and Peyton are brother and sister, and they're three and two. Can you imagine raising a three and a two-year-old at one time? So our daughter is like in crazy land right now. So we call, we FaceTime Colorado, we're talking to them, and she said, I can't let you talk to them right now, they're in timeout. She says, Peyton has taken a gallon of vinegar and poured it in the new closet in the brand new house they just built. And then Peyton has taken lipstick and has painted her brother with lipstick. Peyton is not in the best of places right now. My daughter was likening Peyton, Satan. Peyton, Satan. (laughs) She was not happy with Peyton. But then last night I get a text, my wife and I, we're cookie and pop. So it sends a text. And it's a little video. And Peyton's getting ready to go to bed. And Peyton is praying to Jesus. It's amazing how she goes from Satan to Jesus, all just like that. Just, and she's, you know, God bless Uncle Nate Nate. God bless A. Haley. God bless Baby Carter. God bless Cookie. God bless Pop. I mean, she was just calling on heaven. I, I said to my daughter, don't you ever put her in time out. She's an angel. She's not a day, you know. You know, when we obey God, God knows us. He knows right through. He can see through all the junk. But God knows our heart when we really are wanting to follow him. God's not somebody in heaven going, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I knew he was going to mess up. No, God is a loving God wanting to forgive, desiring to help you, wanting to know that you follow him and that you can see his, unfor- his forgiving love that never fails. So... When it becomes critical, will you still be faithful? And then the last question is this. When God blesses you, will you still worship him? When he blesses you, you're going to continue to worship him? The Bible says, verse 13, Abraham lifted up his eyes, looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by the thorns. Don't you know Abraham's heart skipped a beat right there? 
The Bible said Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So put this picture in your mind. Here's prior to this, Abraham and Isaac, and he tells the men to stay back. They're heading up the mountain with the, the knife, with the, the fire, with the wood, and they get here. Then he lays him on the altar to begin to sacrifice God. Okay, if you want to speak, if you want to step up, he'd be good for you to remember us. Any old time, God, I'm ready. I'm needing it. What he did not know was every step up that mountain of obedient faith. God had already got a ram over here and had that ram walking up the mountain at the same time. God was already providing the answer. He was just waiting on the critical time for Abraham to be obedient so he could show him what he was already up to. And then God allowed Abraham to experience the blessing. And what did Abraham do? Abraham begins to obey God and now bless God. Now, I just want to make this statement here. God does not want your Isaacs. What he really wants is you. Now, don't, don't miss this. God is a sovereign God, meaning he knows everything. And in God's plan, God is going to bring a Messiah. If you're back in Abraham, God is going to bring a Messiah. We know today God did bring one in that of Jesus Christ. God does not have to have you in the story, but God chose to save you. If you're a believer, God did that for you. God allowed you to be in his story. He's allowing us to take place in the story of redemption and of the church and all of those things. And we should be grateful that God would use us and allow us to be part of that. So the Bible says in verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. The Lord there is Jehovah Jireh, meaning the God that provides. And it's said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, this is what I found in 30 something years, 35 plus years of ministry. This is what I found. More people will call on God when they're walking up this side of the mountain and when they're facing the biggest trials of their life, it's easier to get people to call on God. But after the ram is provided, after God answers the prayer, after the heat's off, after things are okay, we so quickly forget that God stepped in at the right time, that God answered that prayer, that God led that way, that God did that, and we don't give him praise, honor, and glory in the end and continue to show others what God can do. And I'm telling you, Abraham is called to leave a place that he's lived his whole life to go to somewhere he don't even know. That's unprecedented in his time. But don't you know Isaac could say, as God used him in his life, well, I saw my dad and God honored it. I saw God move, and I'm going to do it as well because I saw what God did for my dad. So I've been telling you, your story is important. Abraham says this is the place God provided. In verse 17 and 18, we're almost done. He says, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sand of the seashore. Uh, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Do you catch that phrase? He says, Abraham, those who follow you are going to actually go to the gate of the enemy and take care of things. They're going to be able to go to battle because of what you've done. Now, I don't know. You may be here today. I was raised in a godly home. You might not have been. But I promise you this. You can turn around the story and the narrative from your, from your home forward. It can be a different narrative. I don't know, I've only heard this story. I don't, obviously wasn't there to be part of it. But my great, great grandmother, Savannah Davis, died when she was 92 years old. I was eight. And the story I've been told by my family that prior to that time, my family was not in church. A few of them knew the Lord, but they were out of church, away from God. A lot of my family did not know the Lord, was not in church, had no relationship with the church or with God. And, and, and some of them, some did, but not most of them. And Granny Davis prayed, a prayer warrior, and Granny Davis prayed in her family into the household of God. 
When I was eight years old, she died. She willed me her Bible. I still have it today in my office at home. And, and reading some of the things that Granny Davis, who was not real educated, but she knew God. And because of her, not, it wasn't a man, it was a, a great, great grandmother. Because of her, there are dozens of pastors, preachers, evangelists, missionaries, hundreds and hundreds of people who are serving in churches, deacons, staff, working all over churches everywhere because of a woman that God got a hold of and she stayed there till God blessed it and as a result, honored it with her family. So I tell you to say this, whatever God's doing in your life is for a reason. You say, I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. How can God get glory out of it? Where can you find God speak? Honor it, obey it, and watch what God does. The Bible said in James 2.23, last verse I'll read, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. One day, Abraham went to sleep for the last time, and he woke up. To hearing God say, well done, my friend. Good job. Good job. You kept the faith. And I think we all want to be there, right? So I wonder today, you may be here and you're saying, you don't know, Pastor. You don't know, you don't know, Rodney, man. You don't understand. <laughs> well, and I don't belittle your issue, but I tell you this, I may not understand. I might not can do anything about it. But what's God speaking to you that he can do about it? If you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, go first to him. Go first to the place where he speaks. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, where do I start? Put your faith in him. Trust in him. Give him your life and watch what he does. If you're already a believer, I'm facing the weight of the world on my shoulders right now. The Bible says casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Father, Speaking today to these here in this service, many that are online watching from wherever, I don't know probably anything about their situation. But this wasn't my message, this is yours. This is not my word today, this is yours. This is not my Bible, it's yours. The Holy Spirit, right now, could you speak into their lives? If there's someone today here or online and they've never met you as their Savior, may today be the day they surrender and you speak deeply into their heart as they become a child of God. And then, Lord, I pray for many of us who are already believers. May today be a day that we trust you, that we follow you, that we're obedient to you, and that, God, you begin to speak peace into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.